Welcome back to JK Moto Podcast, a weekly motorcycle podcast for the everyday rider, covering current bike and racing news, specializing in track days, club racing, and great entertainment. We truly do it all. This week, once again, we are brought to you by Working Class Customs, which is a custom fabrication shop out of northern Utah, and you can direct any further questions on that to Cole. And I'm Cole. And I'm Easton. We are your two favorite hosts of your favorite weekly motorcycle podcast. Oh, this is different. This is different, my friend. This is it's different. L- it's light outside. It's light outside. You're not working off of a fraction of a bar on a cell phone. So hey, that, was, that was one time. One time. We don't need yeah. to keep bringing that up. Hopefully people can hear us today. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, we've got some things to get through. But, you know, after the break, I'm so excited for the guest today. Get to that. Of course, after the break, but I'm pretty sure you have what what you've all been waiting for this week's writing tip. Yeah, I do have this week's writing tip. And this week's writing tip is brought to you once again by Bedinger Motorsports, which is private coaching that builds solid riders through vision based training. This week's tip. You ready? I'm ready. Don't be a square. Do the twist. What? Turning your turning your shoulder, shoulders is critical to opening up your field of vision to the left or the right and adding a little extra weight off the bike. It all starts at your hips and your and your core, but that last 5 to 10 degrees of shoulder twist is what most riders lack. Many riders are guilty of riding with their shoulders square or parallel to the bars. That extra little twist when applying body position makes all the difference when it comes to seeing and turning in. Plus, it makes you look more like a pro when Monday morning pro photos get posted. So don't be a square. Don't Do the be a twist. square. Do the twist. Don't be a square. Do the twist. I like that. I like that. I did that. too. Yeah, when I was when I first read oh. it, I was like, "Do the twist." That's a song, old song, and an old dance. But you know, Cole, this uh, this made me think of you, and I was wondering what you were gonna have to say about it because your shoulders are not haven't been the happiest in your time riding motorcycles. And I was I was kind of expecting you to fire back with. Man, Josh, some of us can't freaking twist our shoulders because they won't—they just won't move. But <laughs> well, anyway. it, it's actually—it's actually something I'm working on because some of some of the people I talk to, you know, I put like side by side pictures. Like, look, I'm in the same body position as you, and I've got the comment multiple times. Yeah, all you need to do is turn your upper body just a little bit more because you're too square to the handlebars. So I know that's something that I do and whether I can blame that on my, you know, shoulders being, you know, rock solid and they don't move so good anymore or not. It is something I need to work on. Duly noted. Do the twist. Do the twist. In the proper direction. Don't go opposite. Yeah. Don't <laughs> turn and left. All <laughs> right. <laughs> oh man. No, that's a great writing tip, you know, and I, I love that Josh adds in the the point at the end there where it makes you look better in the photos because, you know, there is there is something to be said for that. If if nothing else, oh, we might not everyone in the world, right? Not everyone can be the fastest person. Not everyone can race. Not everyone can. But man, we can go get some sweet looking photos and post them on Instagram and look awesome out there. So again, like I tell you all the time, not with that attitude, you can't. Fix your attitude. I wasn't That's talking my... about myself. I was talking about the whole world. It is physically impossible for everyone in the world to be the fastest person out there. It's a socialist world. We can we can get there. <laughs> well, on that great note, uh, once again, thanks, Josh, for the for the rider tip. We appreciate it. Keep those coming, and I'd say we roll the intro and get our guest on here. Yeah, let's do it. Yesterday, at one point. I'm going to 153 miles an hour. Welcome, our guest. I'm so excited to have you on here, everybody. Uh, I've been telling Easton for a while. I have been excited to have you on here. This is Wyatt sure. Ferguson, Ferg Factory Racing, Moto America Racer, Club Racing Destroyer, one of the fastest <laughs> people 
that I've had the pleasure of riding around. Uh, oh, I appreciate just some, it. Some, uh, I, I enjoy watching you race. I enjoy watching you ride that bike. But, Thank uh, you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Humble. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Again, we appreciate having you on here. And uh, I'm excited for Easton to get some opportunity. You know, he's probably going to grill you about all kinds of stuff because that's what he does. 100%. That's all I do. That is all the I grilling. do. Grilling. With that, <laughs> where do you want? Where do you want to start grilling him, Easton? Well, so you know, he said Moto America. He said club racing, extravenir or whatever. That's not a real <laughs> word, but it sounds cool. Um, where, where did it all start? Without getting too deep, we don't need to spend you know two hours on your life story. But when when did you start riding? When did you start racing? What got you there? And kind of give us a, a quick synopsis of how we got to where we are today. For sure. Um, well, I started riding. I mean, I had a PW80 when I was like five years old, right? So like I, I did dirt bike stuff. Not competitive, okay. just like trail riding with my dad uh, ever since I was a little kid. And uh, didn't take up a street bike until I was 15 and a half when you can get your learner's permit in Arizona. So I drove around and did the street bike thing for a while, was a street bike guy, uh, went to canyons, that kind of thing, like as a teenager, 16, 17 years old, but never touched a track. It wasn't until after I joined the Marine Corps uh, that I did my first track day. So I was like 26 or 27 when I did my first track day. And then I got my racing license in 2020. Uh, it's actually on my wall over here. It's like September. Yeah, September of 2020. And then I think I did my first race in 2021, like early 2021. Didn't start racing until quite a bit later. So I've only been doing this for like the racing thing for a few years. But I got real heavy into the track day thing when it, uh, like a couple years before I got my race license. And I was going to the track like every other weekend kind of thing. Like uh, I was in the military and Marine Corps. So I was just on anytime I could get leave or like anytime we had a weekend off and there was a track day. Like I was at the track all weekend. Like I, I didn't even have a trailer or anything. I rented at the time. I rented a, a U-Haul, like a van for twenty dollars a day plus miles, <laughs> and I would rent it the night before, load my bike up in it, drive to Summit Point, West Virginia, and sleep in the back of the U-Haul, and then like get up and do the track day stuff, and then drive home. You know, and then uh, eventually I was like, I need to get a trailer. <laughs> yeah. So I got a trailer and uh, started traveling. You know, and doing more stuff. Once I got out the Marine Corps, you know, got pretty much became my life <laughs> heck yeah all right so doing so you didn't race at all until after you got out then that's what you're saying uh yeah no i i so i got out in 2021 so as far as the marine corps is concerned i never raced till i got out but <laughs> i think i did do a couple of you know races like you know amateur level races at like summit point and stuff but nothing Nothing super competitive. Like, I, I don't even think I raced outside of Summit Point for the first year because okay. that's just where I was. So I just went to one track. There was a, actually a organization called Moto Gladiator, and they did, like, a, a one race during the track day kind of thing. Like, it was, like, a track day org. Uh, Evolve GT was the track day org, and they had, like, a within their org was, Evolve, or was a Moto Gladiator, and they did, like, one race that was really for, like, track day guys. You know what I mean? So I did those mm -hmm. every once in a while, but... As far as like okay. actual racing, it was with the uh, CCS at the time back east. CCS that does racing anymore. They got bought out and now they're uh, ASRA. Yeah, but that's right. Anyways, so what? Just like out of curiosity, what made the switch? You know, doing track days for a few years. That's kind of what I'm doing. I know Cole's got a, you know, he's he's getting old, so he's got to get that bucket list knocked off. So he just went straight from track days to <laughs> racing to next year he'll be in MotoGP or something like that. Uh, I'm taking a note. I'm taking a note real quick on how long it took you to pop off with the old jokes because you're getting you're getting quicker. I gotta pull it in <laughs> where I can, you know. Gotta pull it in where I can. But uh, what you know, what for you was that kind of deciding factor? You just wake up one day like, ah, my name's Wyatt. I'm a racer now, or um, push from other no. people. I mean, um, so I, I like. There was a few coaches uh, when I was a track day guy, right? That like I got to know pretty well and. I never, I never like paid the extra to have like a one-on-one -on -one coach for the day. Instead, I just like kind of tried to steal them from the person who did pay for them. Like I would just hang out in their pit and talk to them and listen to what they have to say. And then when they went out, I would just like be on my bike and wait for them to roll out. And then I'd roll out behind them. So I got to know you're some still, of the coaches. You're still that well guy. 
yeah, <laughs> facts. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, yeah, so I, I just kind of towed the, co- like, tried to get a tow from the coaches. And um, there was a, uh, Alberto Amici, a, he was a coach at Evolve GT, this guy from Italy, who I guess he did Moto3 for a little while. I got to know him pretty well. And he was probably the first one to tell me, like, hey, dude, you need to, you should get a racing license. Like, you, you'd be pretty good at this. And so um, I really liked him, you know, and we didn't know each other too well at the time, but he, like, every, he was like the fast coach of Evolve GT, right? Like, if you went up and said, hey, who's your fastest coach? I want to tell, you know, they'd be like, go talk to him. I, I thought, okay, you know, I'll get I'll get my racing license. So that's who I actually got my racing license through is Evolve GT, that track they were, um, they had a race school. And, uh, okay. and then, yeah, I mean, uh, in the, I don't know, Ethan, do you have your racing license yet? I do not, no. So when you get your racing license, which I'm sure you will, right, They you have to do a mock race mm-hmm. uh, at the end. And like pretty much every org that I've seen, the only goal of the mock race is don't crash, right? You just have to finish the race and then like, boom, you don't, graduate. Don't crash in giant wheelies is what I've seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, so we did that. And my first mock race, they didn't want to do uh, like a mock race because they didn't have time. So they said, we're just going to put you, and there's only like three students in the race school. So they were like, mm-hmm. we're going to just put you three in the back of the little bike race grid. And I was on an R1 when I was taking the class. And okay. uh, I, right off the start, like I just launched it, right? And it, I went from the back of the grid to the front of the grid. So did the other racing students because they were on like R6s. But then by turn one, all of us are just track day guys who don't know how to like trail break into a corner or anything like that, right? So like we over break coming in turn one and these little like 300s and shit just start flying by <laughs> us. And I, I actually got smacked. Like one of them was like a supermoto guy and he like, el- sorry, <laughs> he elbowed me. And uh, I was like, this is it. Like this is way different than a track day because this track day is that six feet. You know, mm-hmm. no passing on the inside on some groups, like stuff like that. You know, it's like a very different vibe than like, hey, do whatever you have to do to get past the guy in front of you. You know, <laughs> like that. Yeah. That was a cool head change. So I liked it. So that that feeling right there, I want to dig. You still remember that feeling, don't you? That first corner. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I remember I, I it's like a, I'm able to replay it in my head. I, I remember exactly what the corner looked like getting smacked and thinking like for a split second thinking I want to get off the track like this is crazy. But then as soon as you like put your head down and you start, you know, doing it too and you, your mentality is not like a survival mentality. It's more of like a hunter mentality. Then it starts like getting faster right. and faster and you build on that. Exactly. I like that too. But I tell, I tell Easton all the time. I remember the first corner, first race vividly for the same reasons. It was like, this is different. Like, yeah, I, I'd done a bunch of track days. I was cool, whatever. And then all of a sudden it, you weren't just trying to pass somebody you were, you needed to pass somebody or it was survival of the fittest. It just changed. Yeah. It's, yeah. 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 It's a whole different head like game it, it's it's a it's a pretty addicting i'm sure cole knows like it's it's addicting <laughs> especially once you start getting past guys that used to pass you and that just builds and builds <laughs> that's that might be the biggest reason i didn't, haven't actually done it yet is uh i already have an addictive personality and i don't know if my pocketbook can quite keep up with that many tires <laughs> so anyway but we'll see we'll see what's in the future the other the other thing why it just said is uh the hunter mentality that switch mm-hmm. I haven't necessarily heard it said that way. I always tell people that don't ride motorcycles. I say, do you, have you ever drove a go-kart? Cause a go-kart is kind of a safe space. You know, anybody can go get on a go-kart with their family or whatever. And you know, all different levels of comp- competing, right? Obviously. But when you, when you're in a go-kart, you're, there's no fear of throwing it into a corner cause you don't think you're going to get hurt. But on a motorcycle for that first, when you first start racing or even first start doing track days, it's like a really scary go-kart because you don't want to die. And you when, also paid for it yourself. <laughs> well, when yeah. that switch, what you said, when you become the hunter, when all of a sudden you're not worried about dying in the corner so much as being able to attack that guy in front of you and you become the hunter, that's when it really gets fun. You got to get through like the pain point yeah. to where now you're comfortable enough to be chasing people and then it's off the charts fun. I agree. Yeah. Once the fear transitions from like 
the fear of crashing to the fear of not catching that guy in front of you and having to come back in the pits and all your boys being like, what happened? <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, well, so you mentioned out here, West Virginia or Virginia, right? Not West. Uh, West Virginia is where Summit Point oh, was. That's where I started. Right. Okay. With Evolve GT, I believe you're down in Arizona now. You've been racing with there a little bit. You're racing USBA this year. Maybe winning USBA this year. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, well, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? What was that transition like? Just going from from one side to the other. Um, we've always kind of been curious. You know, I think this is the first time we've met someone that has raced at least on both sides of the country. So I'm just kind of curious what the differences that you've noticed are. Well. Uh, I know that when I first came out west, the first um, organization that I raced out that was like west of the Mississippi or whatever um, was ASMA, uh, Roger Heemsberg's organization. Uh, it's out of New Mexico, but they race in Arizona and New Mexico. The grids, uh, I think my first track that I raced out here on the west coast after moving home um, was Wild Horse West in Arizona, and it's a pretty like small technical track, and the grids... That was the first thing I noticed was that the grids were a lot smaller out west here. Um, I'll caveat and say that the I have learned now that the exception is CVMA. CVMA has about the same grids that they had back east, um, like thirty dudes and expert in middleweight. You know what I mean? Yeah, back east, every race that I raced with like CCS, ASRA was at least like thirty guys on the grid. I'd say at least twenty, twenty to thirty, somewhere in there. I raced the race champions in Daytona and the Daytona grid was like 60 guys. Wow. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and there's just nothing like that out here other than CVMA gets pretty close. Like there's like 30 some guys on the grid for middleweight uh, most weekends, I'd say. Uh, at least there was this past year. It's funny, all the guys on the East Coast, I remember when I started racing in the East Coast, just like any other sport, guys are all asking each other, like trying to figure out where the best dudes are from, right? Like I'm sure it's the same way, like when you go from, BSB to uh, Moto America. The BSB guys probably think the Moto America guys are super fast. The Moto America guys think the BSB, the British Superbike Championship guys, are super fast. That's how it was east and west here. All the guys on the east coast used to like warn me when I told them I was getting out the Marine Corps and I'm going to move west and race out west. They're like, "Oh, there's a lot of money in California, man. Those boys are fast." And like Classic. when I now that I'm out here and I talk to guys from California, right? They're like, oh, all the fast dudes are back east because there's so many tracks, man. Like everybody <laughs> thinks that the like the opposite side of the country is crazy fast, you know. But it's it. I'd say they're about the same. There's like, you know, five to ten guys at any club racing weekend that I go to. That's a major like CVMA or back east uh, ASRA. That the, the top ten dudes are pretty pretty fast. <laughs> um, they. Uh, they, they overestimate because they've never seen each other, right? And everyone's afraid of right. what they don't know. And, and we hear, like back east, we would hear about fast guys like Heron, right? Like Josh Heron from California. And then like back here, we hear about all the fast guys that are back east. I can't think of any off the top of my head right now. But um, it everyone just thinks that each other's faster. So I'd say the track quality, obviously the track density on up and down New England is like prime, right? Like mm -hmm. you, you got VIR in Virginia, you have Pittsburgh, you have... New Jersey, you have Daytona, you have Little Tally, you have Alabama, you have like there's so many good tracks up and down the East Coast. And then out here, you know, it's there's still a few good tracks here and there. Most of them don't have racing though. A lot of them are like club organizations. Um, yeah. And then a lot of the race orgs only go to a few tracks like CBMA, who only goes to Chuck Walla and Roger Heemsburg's org, which mostly does Arroyo Seca, New Mexico. So it's like, there's not as big of like a national circuit kind of thing going on. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I was going to comment on that when you said that the West coast guys say that, you know, the track density is higher in the East coast. Cause I, I just moved out here from Washington. And when I look at California and the options and, you know, it, it's interesting cause you think about like long distance and if you look at like Southern California where, where Chuck Walla is, for instance, I'd say within six to eight hours, there are actually quite a few freaking options down there. So you got Laguna right up the road. Yeah. You got a couple tracks over in Arizona, Las Vegas Motor Speedway, and then also the other weird ranch in Nevada that I Cram. don't remember the name of. And then New Mexico and, and whatever else. And if you want to travel a little bit further, you get Utah. So it's an interesting comment. I think I'd, I agree 
somewhat, but I'm not so sure. I don't know if density is the word I would use, I guess. Put it that way. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying with that. It, I think a lot of it is all those tracks, like out here on the West Coast, they're all managed by different race orgs. They have different mm -hmm. track day orgs. They have different schedules. They have, and, and back East, all those tracks, like every single one, at least back when I was there, it was CCS. So like you went to one website and you got to see what was coming up. You got to see when the dates were, you got to schedule out your race season. You know what I mean? Like out here, if you want to hit all those different tracks, you kind of got to be like, Oh, well this one CBMA is the same time as asthma. And okay, I can't do that round. And maybe I can make these rounds. You know what I mean? I, I think, and yeah. most racers are like short attention spans. So if they can't just like click a button on a website <laughs> and sign up for the season, they're not doing all of it. Oh, <laughs> so. uh, that's fair. Well, there you go. I guess that's the, the question to be answered is who's going to come and just combine all the race orgs on the West Coast to make one one big one. The issue is it gets, it gets so hot that's out there. I'd, I'd love to see. It would be good. Maybe uh, maybe I'll start poking people. We'll see what happens. Uh, there you go. Well, you can't, you can't have that conversation without bringing up the new Legion, SBK League, right? I guess. I mean, it's in Colorado, is it not? Yeah, but they're they're combining what six tracks? I yeah, think they've they're... got six tracks on their schedule. So I mean, they're trying to do something along those lines. That's cool. Better so I didn't even know about this. Yeah, so Legion just started up, uh, and they're what Colorado, Utah. I think they're going down to New Mexico, Oklahoma, and o Oklahoma. Yeah, and uh, so they had their they had their first race last weekend, or when you're listening to this, two weekends ago, and. Their next round is in Utah the second week of July. So Utah's on their six track schedule. That's With pretty the cool. Perimeter. Yeah. So Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Doing something a little different. So Yeah, so I, I gotta I gotta I gotta be honest though. The I'm trying to sign up for it right now and it's like pages. So you talk about yeah, the racing <laughs> you talk about the racing. That's racer what I was gonna say, dude. <laughs> I'm having a hard time just clicking buy now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's got to be easy, man. We're we're fast. We're not smart. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, well, speaking of fast, not smart. You said an R one for your your race school, and you know we we know you as the R six guy now. You're racing Super Sport and Moto America, and we'll we'll get more into Moto America here in a little bit. But uh, I'm just curious when that switch happened. You know what what was the first bike you took to the track? When did we make it to the R one? Unless that just was that's that cool. And why and when did we switch back to an R6? Um, all right. So first bike I took to the track was a actually a 2011 ZX-10. Um, okay. It was a street bike uh, that I rode to work every day. I actually didn't have a car. This is when I was getting the U-Hauls and going to the track, taking mm. the ZX-10. Mm -hmm. It was my daily driver. Like I drove it to work every single day to the barrack because I lived with my wife off off-site. <clears throat> I took the ZX-10. I ended up getting hit one day on the way to work on the freeway on my ZX-10 um, by a guy changing lanes into the HOV lane. So it totaled the bike. I was okay. So then with the insurance money from that, I bought a uh, 2016 R1. Okay. Um, I was still very much a street guy, just dabbling in the track stuff at this time, you know. Mm -hmm. Then um, that bike got hit by a car. <laughs> also, like on my way to work, I got hit again. And my wife was like, no more of this uh, street stuff. Hold on, you got to stop because I've heard this story before. I need to hear the story again. What <laughs> happened to the R one? Let's have that story so, again. The all right. So I'm I'm I mean it's I'm driving on the way to the driving to work to the barracks right, and I had just I had just dabbled in like getting more into the track stuff. So I actually had track bearings on the R one, but it had a license plate and a tail light still. And uh, okay. <laughs> And I, so like, I wanted to be able to ride it on the street if I wanted to. Right. But like, I was trying to dedicate more to the track stuff. Right. So it had track bearings. Mm -hmm. I painted them with my wife. Like they were like real nice, special to me, that whole thing. And, uh, I was, I got halfway to work or if that, and I thought, oh dude, I should go back and get my GoPro and like record the ride. Right. Cause I just wanted to show my buddies at the barracks, my bike that I built that I had been talking about racing. And, um, Anyways, I went back to the barracks, got the GoPro, stuck it on the back, and then started driving to work again. And as I get on the freeway, some chick starts changing lanes, like, up ahead of me. And, like, uh, there was a merge on the right, and I was in the HOV lane. And she just starts coming over. And I remember I, like, saw her out of the corner of my eye, and I thought, like, this 
whatever is <laughs> not your fight. See, I can't even knock us, dude. I can't. Um, <laughs> tell the story the way you want to tell it. It's fine. But uh, she starts coming over, and I'm like, this chick is – I was like, she's – freaking flying you know uh, and i kind of like didn't think anything about it. i thought she was going to change a couple lanes without a turn signal you know but no dude it was like that that family guy meme like good luck everybody else like i'm turning left and she <laughs> comes over and i act at, at the time that i reacted fast enough i guess i i wasn't fast enough um i because i was going faster than she was and she's changing lanes right and then we meet at the tip of the hov lane basically and i like grabbed my brake and Went over the handlebar, like I, I, sh- I hit her like back quarter panel, like at a, at a like a forty five degree angle, like I'm traveling straight, and it was just like boom, you know. Anyways, um, not my fault, you know, legally. And uh, went over the handlebars, and uh, I was trying to stop the bike. Like after I went over, both my legs landed on one side of the bike, and I was trying to stop the bike, like with the front brake, because I'm like kind of coasting forward now, like bike's destroyed. I'm like wobbling. It's like a scene from YouTube, and. <laughs> I couldn't figure out why I couldn't stop the brake, and I didn't know, but um, I had broken this finger, and it was like 90 degrees off to the side. And I was trying to grab brake, but my finger doesn't work, and I don't know that, right? So I had to, like, bail off the bike, and I, like, let the bike go, and I roll on the ground, and I stood back up, and I look forward, and I see the bike just coasting down the free, like, go, ghost riding or whatever down the freeway, and it, like, hits the concrete wall and is bouncing off the concrete walls. And I was so mad, dude, in a car. I'm standing in the freeway now. Like I'm just standing in, and a car honks at me behind me and I, I like turn around to like, you know, like put my hand up and like tell him to stop. And when I turn around and look at my hand, my finger is like, you know, crooked. And I was just like, oh, and just like couldn't look at it. And, and anyways, I was, I was so mad, dude. But that was the end of the thousand stuff. Um, honestly, never even got to take it to the track. Like I track fitted it. I did, the bike had been painted for maybe a week, like maybe a week, oh, and it had been sitting in my garage, and I'd been waiting for a track day to take it to, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to drive it to work and show the boys, you know, <laughs> and like, so that was that, but uh, but no, after that, no more street bike stuff, said the wife, you know, uh, and she knew I liked the track stuff better anyways. Her and I are both from Arizona, so the street bike stuff out in Arizona was a lot different than the street bike stuff in Washington, D.C., which is where we were stationed at the time. So, like, Washington, D.C. is, like, the DMV area is garbage. Like, it's just yeah. clustered freeways and crazy drivers. So, yeah, so I uh, I started looking for a track bike. I still remember the guy's name was Glenn. Uh, he was, like, a, I don't know, like, an astronautical physics guy. Like, he was crazy smart, dude, and had the bike on uh facebook marketplace it was a 2008 r6 and i had an r6 in high school and a, a, a 2006 is what i had this was a 08 same kind of ish generation mm-hmm. um a little bit different but and i knew i liked the bike in high school you know and i thought all right you know i'll get a 600 and all the guys like that alberto avici coach that i said i kind of latched on to that told me i should race he had an r6 and he always told me that I should get a 600, a smaller bike, he said, because I was learning bad habits on the 1,000, right. like not knowing what I was doing and kind of like making up my lap time by twisting the throttle more, you know what I mean? Rather than having to learn how to carry roll speed or trail brake or all these other things that make your lap time come down when you don't have the horsepower to make it up. Later, um, later bikes are are good at the twisting the throttle. Yes. Part. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you definitely... <laughs> start getting away with some things that you shouldn't get away with, you know, Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, so I got the R6, uh, didn't do anything to it. Like bought it as is it had track plastics and it had like a bizazz tune on it, you know, like a a piggyback unit. Like I didn't know anything about nothing, but the bike ran good when I went and looked at it. And so I started riding it and, uh, that's actually, I still have that bike. And, um, I raced that for, about a year and a half on the east coast as an amateur and then uh raced it for about another year as an expert when i got out west and it's been a great okay. bike dude i i love the r6 i really do it's a little underpowered now with the whole next gen super sport um, rules you have to do a lot to the r6 to make it a competitive package as far as the engine goes but the chassis and everything like the r6 handles great sweet so uh so that was 08 what are your what year is the one you're on now? Uh, the one I race in Moto America is a 2020. Okay. So I think 2021 was the last year that they even produced the R6 race, like the race 
Spurgeon. So, yeah, yeah. one of the last years. Everybody always yeah. says, at a club level, everybody always says our sixes are underpowered, you know, when we're watching Moto America. It's, it's a common thing. Right? It's, it's obvious. Everybody, everybody knows it, believes it. So are all these R6 out here just souped up? Because the R6s are the fastest thing at any track day you go to. Or any, I, are they, I don't know. Are they I, that good or, or? I mean, so I don't have a whole lot to base it. Like I've never gotten to race a ZX6 or the other 600s that are in the class. Um, I've ridden like CBR 600s, but not at a competitive level or anything. Like I've never pushed it to see if it has, if I can get the same lap times as my R6 or something like that. But I think the R6 just... I mean, it, I, I believe, this might be wrong, but I believe that the R6 is the most winningest bike, or however they say that, um, for AMA. Like, I think it has more wins and more, like, compared to its number of grids than any other bike. So I think there's a lot of support for it. I know when I started racing at CVMA, there's a lot of guys who used to talk a lot about the R6 being, like, the best, like, mechanical guys talking about how the R6 is, like, the best middleweight like the chassis and everything and that's that i feel the same way about the handling and the chassis and everything i think the r6 is a pretty easy bike relatively speaking to get set up for someone and have them be able to go out and go fast like mid corner and stuff like that like it may not have the top end of the zx6s or the jigsaw 750 now um but it's it's got a lot of corner speed that's like its strength i think is you can once you let go of the lever the bike really wants to be on rails mid corner but i think i think it's just an easy platform to get on and go relatively fast like you were saying once you get in that hunter mentality right like once you start getting relatively fast it's easier to get faster as the rider right so i think the r6 is just an easy bike to jump on and it feel comfortable to where you're like you're not concentrating on dying anymore you're concentrating on catching the guy in front of you because the bike feels like planted so I know that the ZX6 is kind of the op, at least I've heard is kind of the opposite of that. The ZX6 can be kind of hard to ride, but it's got a lot of power, but the bike kind of wants to buck you off of it when you're getting on the throttle and stuff like that. Hmm. I see a lot of pumping with the rear swing arm. Like when I'm chasing guys on ZX6s, I see when we, when we corner exit, I'm, I'm just opening the throttle as soon as I can. And I see them having to kind of like open the throttle and the bike starts pumping, like the right. swing arm and frame start kind of going in and out. And then they have to roll off and on, you know what I mean? Like they're managing this like geometry frame issue that's going on. And like, I don't have none of that on the R6. The only issue is that I'm not putting enough power to the ground. <laughs> Interesting. I think it's a good platform. Well, it's a good platform if you can afford one. <laughs> anymore. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Building it. <laughs> They've gotten they've gotten pretty ridiculous as of late. Yeah, now in Moto America you can you can add cams which are like, you know, fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars, and then you can do a port and polish job and you can do deck heading, you can do like there's a lot of stuff now that they allow the R six to do, which my, my twenty twenty doesn't have none of that. My my twenty twenty is just a deck head. Like I'll be candid, the, the my twenty twenty that I race in Moto America makes when it was tuned, right? Like when it was fresh built which I'm sure it's less now. It was making 122 horsepower with MGP, with the Moto America spec fuel. And it was making 124.8, I think, on on U4.4, which was like the fuel that I used at club races. When I look at ZX6 numbers, like ZX6 guys are making, like with a pipe and a tune, ZX6 makes 135 horsepower. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, it is what it is. I put like 10 grand into the motor of that bike just to get it decked, like, and the motor put back together and refreshed and stuff like that. And, you know, now knowing what I know now, could have got a ZX6, put a couple thousand dollars into it. <laughs> the same, but it's all right. Yeah, then you'd the be bouncing coming out of the turn. Exactly, so. exactly, exactly. Right. Yeah, it's all, all right. trading. You know, it's, it's pros and cons. So, I mean, in, in you know, in Moto America, you're up there with Ducati V2s, Jigsaw 750s, the ZX6s, and I've actually seen an MV on the list. Yeah, two of them last round. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't even know what model that those would be. I think it's called but... an F3. They're three-cylinder okay. 800. Okay. Yeah. Kind of like the Triumph. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So a, a whole bunch of uh, very much larger displacement bikes. It's, the ZX6 is actually the closest thing. We just talked about how yeah. even that like. <laughs> So that's that's Moto America, but back in club racing, generally you've still got the 600, you know, the GTU, GTO, over and under 600 CCs. Do you is like is there an obvious competitiveness shift 
there, right? And oh, yeah. besides, like, like the, the yeah, besides riding, you know, the the quality of riders and things like that. That's not what I'm trying to get into, but just still having that actual 600 and below class. Yeah, does that help? Yeah, out? no, it, it is definitely a difference. Um, it seems like most clubs, or some clubs, I should say now, are making it to where like their middleweight superbike classes will follow the FIM standard, which is what Moto America goes off the next gen stuff. So like you might mm -hmm. be able to race a Jigsaw 750 with the detune kit that's required by Moto America, right? As long as you have that, I'll, most it seems like most club orgs will allow you to race that in middleweight superbike, but super stock or super sport or whatever they call it, their stock class for the middleweight guys, they usually stick to the traditional rules of like 600 cc limit except for the zx6 which gets a pass so yeah there's definitely a difference um like speed that you can see on the grid uh, or at least like when you're coming down the straightaway when you're trying to pull against the next gen 750s or the ducatis or something like that compared to just the 600s a lot of times i tell my dad this all the time like he'll when i complain right like because obviously i complain about the bike being underpowered right <laughs> so mm -hmm. when i'm complaining about that stuff you know like i'll hear my dad say something like well i watched you come down the straight with so-and-so who might, who's like on a 750 and he's like it didn't look like he was pulling on you and i have to like remind him a lot of times that there's a lot of factors that go into like when you watch two guys go down the straight and you're trying to gauge if they're gapping each other or not right like how fast they're going when you see them is all determined at the apex of the last corner like who right. had the better line who got on the gas first who had more roll speed like who's geared correctly for this straightaway you know what i mean like there's so many mm -hmm. factors that go into it so it's really hard to like base base your your judgment of like is this fair for the class or is this bike way faster than the r6 or whatever it's hard to judge that off of one or two instances of seeing the bikes go down a straightaway or whatever so i, 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 I was just gonna so, say another factor are you your size or are you Corey alexander's size exactly yeah yeah so i weigh like 150 pounds you know so me on the r6 it's gonna look a little bit more fair if like Corey alexander i don't know how much he weighs but probably like a buck 80 i don't know he's he's a tall dude if <laughs> if we're going down the straightaway he might have 10 horsepower on me but i might weigh 30 pounds less you know what i mean right. so mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what the exact horsepower to weight ratio is of a motorcycle on average, you know, if that's if that's fair if, at that point. But but yeah, so I, I do. There is a noticeable difference to me as the rider, like when I am behind somebody and we're coming out of a corner and I can hear when they get on the throttle and then I get on the throttle, you know, like about the same time or same point on the track. And then we start pulling. That's how I can gauge like, oh, that's a fast bike. Like, cause I know I got on the gas the same as him. And I know I got good drive out of that corner. And he's still yarding me down the straight where as a, as a bystander, unless you can, unless you're like close enough to the apex or something to hear the guys getting on the gas and you know what you're listening for and stuff like that. Like if Anthony Norton tells me that like, Hey dude, your bike is slow. I listen to you guys get on the gas at the same time. I, then I know he's right. You know what I mean? But when if i have someone else come up to me and be like hey dude how come you can't catch him at the end of the straight i have to be like <laughs> you know but uh but no it's it's it pros and cons you know like i can't put it all on the bike or anything like it, it the thing is is being 10 15 horsepower down if you were to stick Corey alexander on my bike and get it set up for him he'd be turning probably within a second of his lap times on that ducati you know what i mean like mm -hmm. so all right there's, there's a big skill gap, and then there's a little bit of a mechanical gap. Well, hey, when you when you have something that is, like, for sure true, it's perfectly fine to blame it on that. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, yeah, it's definitely the bike's underpower. Definitely. Let's see. Well, let, let's dig into the Moto America a little bit. So I, I, I think this is okay to air, but you raced your first Moto America race last year? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pittsburgh, uh, 2023. That was yeah, my first you did, one. You did one round and then we've stepped it up this year. You're not yep. doing the, you're not doing the full series, but you're doing yeah, not for super sport. Yeah. But for super stock 1000, I mean, it's their full season. You know what I mean? So. Right. That's right. Yeah. A well, lot for me. <laughs> so maybe it's too early to tell, but what's the plan for next year? Uh, 
you know, that's what I lose nights of sleep over right there. Uh, you know, I, I am going to do everything I can next year. You know what I mean? Like, I'd love to be able to say like, oh, I'm gonna come back to a full season or another five rounds or whatever. But um, yeah, I don't really know uh, what the plan is. You know, I talked to Anthony uh, Lugnut Northen a lot uh, about his plans for the next year and stuff. Cause he's really what um, I, I know you guys know this, but he, he's the one that facilitated this whole thing uh, and really made it possible for me to do more than one round. Cause like before I had, before this plan came about to do the stock 1000 rounds with Anthony Norton on the privateer team, I thought maybe I'd do two rounds uh, like me and my dad. Cause that's all that it pretty much was last time. And it's just logistically, it's hard for just me and my dad to go out across country and then do everything for Moto America, you know what I mean? Like do, ha, my dad has to do basically everything, like the tires, the fuel, the everything else. Then I, I have to ride the bike, you know, and I'm still pushing it to and from tech. Like it's just me and him, you know? Right. So we, we thought maybe we'd do two rounds. I really wanted to do Laguna and Barber. And then talking to Lugnut about it, you know, he was like, well, why don't you just come do five? And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. But uh, no, he talked me into it. And uh, it was, I'm glad, obviously, that I did. Um, this has been a big learning experience. Like doing multiple rounds, especially these next few weeks are kind of back to back. It really makes you, it kind of forces you to get comfortable with a lot of the little things. Um, kind of reminds me of the military, honestly. Like how they, in the military, in the Marine Corps, they talk a lot about being comfortable, being uncomfortable. Right. Um, that you start performing better, the more that you're in an un uncomfortable space and your body and your mind is used to being out of its comfort zone, the easier those things become. Right. And uh, my first round when I did Pittsburgh in 2023 with my dad, like, oh, my gosh, I was so stressed. Like I barely slept the whole weekend. You know what I mean? And I was just very uncomfortable and uh, intimidated and stuff like that. And now after we've done two rounds now this year and uh, already I feel a lot better like coming into the second round we went to Brainerd I felt way better than when we went to Alabama you know what I mean so now mm -hmm. we're, we're going to the Ridge next and I'm not nearly as worried about it as I was the previous round you know what I mean and so I'm hoping that only builds and becomes more and more prevalent and it'll be easier and easier to do these things until it feels like the club race is the goal like for me because when I go to the club races I don't get like worked up anymore like it's an enjoyable thing like I'm excited to go out I'm not like stressed or worried or like wondering if I'm going to do okay, like none of that. It's just like fun, you know? And so it'd be nice for this national level stuff to just be able to go out, have a good time and go fast, you know? So hopefully by the end of the year, that's what's happening. So that'll be, yeah, you guys are going the Ridge and then down to Laguna Seca. Laguna. Yeah. yeah. Laguna's right. next. Got, yeah. It says Monterey in here. I don't know why they don't just say Laguna Seca, but yeah. anyway, sweet. So, I mean, that's a little bit closer to home. Is that, is that nicer? Like, are you more excited oh, for yeah. those two rounds than everything out here? Well, Laguna for sure. Um, Laguna has been, uh, one of the tracks that I've wanted to hit for a long time. Um, I've actually never raced Laguna. I did a, I went to the 2008 MotoGP there, um, when Casey Stoner and Rossi battled. And I got to ride mm -hmm. the like parade lap on an SB650 I had. Um, nice. So that's like the only time I've been on the track, like is following a pace car at 35 miles an hour with a bunch of Harleys. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, yeah. uh, but but I've, I've watched so many races there and um, played so many racing video games and, and played Laguna Seca that like I can close my eyes and run through every turn. You know what I mean? Of, of Laguna. So I'm not too intimidated by it but i am super excited like i cannot wait to go to laguna and get to actually go down like the corkscrew is like a you know like a wet dream for me i i love the whole corkscrew thing so i can't wait for that the ridge i'm a little oh, intimidated yeah. by if i'm going to be honest uh i know it's known for some gnarly crashes and uh the waterfall section is uh kind of it's kind of like a corkscrew i guess but it seems it seems like there's a lot of rain there so if it rains I think that's why they call it the waterfalls because it looks like a freaking waterfall. <laughs> the good old ridge <laughs> complex. I, I will tell you, it was actually designed after the Laguna's cake, Laguna Seca's corkscrew. It was designed to, to kind of oh, mimic really? it and, on a smaller cool. scale. Yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that turns nuts. And I'm, I'm going to be with you guys there at the ridge, you know, for moral support Sweet. and all that kind yep. of good stuff. And, uh, so I've already been watching the weather because I'm that guy. You've probably been looking too. But right now, I'm, there's no such thing as a jinx, so I'll say it. it it's going to be good. 
Yeah. Uh, the middle of, middle of June, good. July, it's yeah. going to be good in a rough way. It's going to be hot and dry. It actually, there. it actually looks good that way too. I mean, we're okay. looking at like high seventies, low eighties. Well, that that's that's money right there. Then, mm. all right. Well, I'll take hot any day. It was one hundred and sixteen here in Arizona yesterday. So, like, you... if it's like ninety or ninety five, that's like a good day for me, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you guys don't race in the summer, right? No. Like you... Yeah, yeah. So... Same thing with CVMA. They they're like a winter series. So mm-hmm. yeah, like, dude, May through August here is like you don't go outside unless you have to. You okay. Know? Yeah, I just I saw I was, you know, scrolling through social media the other day and saw a video pop up and it was like tires in Arizona in the middle of July and it was just a picture of this truck with just the sticky rubber just literally peeling off when I I don't yeah, think it was off. from a, a year or two ago when it was like a buck 30 out there or something. <laughs> but I just in yeah, my head yeah, imagined I'm like what do you do for tire pressure when it's that hot? I was like, wait a second, yeah. you just don't ride. Okay, never mind. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, you're stuck out here. I mean, the tracks, like the private track, Podium Club, for example, um, they'll they'll usually open their doors at like 4.30, 5 a.m. And then at around 10 or 11, they go on like a day break. Um, they don't have lights, but there's, there's other places out here that do have lights. Uh, like there's one track at Wild Horse Pass and then PKRA and they'll do night stuff, right? So they'll open during the morning and then shut for the middle of the day and then open up again at like 5 PM or 6 PM. So that's, that's, kinda that's cool. how we get around it out here. All right. So you can stay open most of the year just running at night. I know it doesn't, is one night, one nice part about the desert is it does cool down at night. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. That's where you're at. Sweet. So after yeah. you most recently just finished with Brainerd, uh, that was your first experience at that track. Josh Heron's been quoted as calling it the trailer park of tracks. What say you? Um, well, I actually, you know, now that now that I wrote it, it's not so bad. But when I first got there, it's I never like to judge tracks by the facilities or like anything other than the track itself. Right. Because that's what I'm there for. Like I, I get that, like when it has nice facilities and stuff like Alabama, um, right. that's, that's a cherry on top kind of thing. But, um, but as far as the track itself goes, uh, Brainerd is, uh, like, obviously it's like one of those tracks that they've been racing at for a long time. So there's a lot of history there. Right. And like, guys don't want to knock it off the calendar or anything. And I'm not saying I want to, but the, uh, there's a few spots on the pavement that are pretty, pretty rough. The transition from the straightaway to turn one is uh, pretty bumpy in my experience. And there's a big, it's a hard seam that you kind of have to go over. And it was like bucking me up enough to make my, like I'm full pinned in fifth, you know, and like the, I'm going over it and the needle on the RPM on the tack is like, <laughs> so I didn't like that. Um, but other than that, the track itself was not so bad. It's definitely a fast track. There's a couple of little technical sections, like as you're coming into the carousel and the chicane and stuff like that. Uh, it seems to me that sector one is um, like, how fast can you go through turn one, turn two? But I don't know if I'd call it the trailer park of <laughs> tracks, but um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely not on, it, it's on the lower end of, of what, of Moto America's nice versus not nice tracks, right? Like. Moto America sees Laguna Seca and Alabama, like I've mentioned, and stuff like that. And those are, I'd say, towards the top of the list as far as, like, how nice they are. Um, and then, you know, there's a few of them that are more towards the bottom. And so Brainerd, maybe on quality of track or something like that, might be down there. But I liked it. I mean, there was a lot of grip at the track. Like, it's it may not have the best surface as far as bumps and stuff, but I was able to break, and like, real hard and trail break deep into stuff. Like, even... I think turn 12 had like a bump right at the apex and everybody was complaining about it, but everybody rode over it. Cause there was enough grip to just plow over the bump. You know what I mean? So the surface was not horrible. So I thought it was okay. Well, you mentioned not to get off on a side note, but you said, uh, you know, you're not there to rate the facilities and I'm not here to rate the facilities, but I did get the opportunity to go to Brainerd last year and, One thing that's great about it, I just want to give him a shout out. One thing that is great about Brainerd is as a spectator, you can just drive around and view the track from so many different areas, so many different locations. You know, if you're not racing or, you know, or you have that kind of time on your hand, that part of it is great. There seemed to be a lot going on when I was there for the, for the spectator. So 
don't want to talk anybody into not going and watching. Oh um, yeah, no, no, no. It's it's definitely worth going and watching at Brainerd because, like I said, the guys are going real fast through the turns. You know what I mean? So as a spectator, that's kind of cool to see guys full pin. Yep. Through the turns yeah. and stuff. And you're right. There is a lot of places for people to view. I, I know I listened to the Moto America guys, the announcers, talk about how this is that Brainerd is the flattest as far as elevation goes. It's the flattest mm-hmm. track that they go to all season. So that's probably why there's so many places to view from because you can right. just drive around this flat complex and find a place to watch. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely good for the spectators. And there was a lot of vendors and a lot of, there's like a, a couple of restaurants like built into the facility. You don't have to worry. Is there going to be a food truck there? Like no, there's a restaurant there. You know what I mean? So right. yeah, so it's, a, a, it's a good place. It's a sharp contrast to the Ridge. For yeah. example, the Ridge is very hard to view for the yeah. spectators. Hey, they, they did just put in new bleachers down at turn 15. So I, I, I get it, but I'll, 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 I'll judge it. I'll judge it this weekend. Well, while Wyatt's out yeah, there they're worried they're... about just the track, because that's what he's there for. I'm going to be the facilities judge. The <laughs> facility snob. Hopefully they open up that bridge that goes across the straightaway. So you can go that, to that viewing area up on yeah, top that, of the actual ridge. That will 100% be open. Cause that's their only real okay. viewing area. And they have some, they have Good. some, uh, bleachers down in turn 15, which I'd said they just updated them. So they're getting like bigger down there, but yeah, it's, the hardest part with the ridge is you you have to go over the track and you get up the hill and you can see a few turns from up there, but you would have to like go over the track again to go somewhere else to get more. And it, I mean, it's a road course. That's you know the biggest complaint, and that's why Americans love NASCAR so much because we can just pack into a football stadium and watch cars crash into each other and call it a day and drink a lot of beer. So <laughs> no um, left turn. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but and, and Easton said there is a TV up by them bleachers too, yeah. so you can. Yeah, they, they will they have to. Put up the Moto America event, so. Yep, they get the big screen up there. They've got. They usually pack a bunch of, uh, you know, out outhouse porta potties up there, and they have a little snack shack, if you want to call it that. It's not bad. They're doing. Uh, I know. Cool. Uh, obviously, I like the Ridge a lot. If you listen to the podcast, you know that. But I like to give them shout outs because they they do constantly build. You know, they're they're new enough, and they've got Moto America now coming in, and they're just kind of constantly building their their rider experience and fan experience. So I like it. Yeah, but, good stuff. Um, so to kind of kick maybe a little bit back out of out of Moto America, unless there was any other questions, Moto America no, wise. Uh, you have done what one round with USBA? Yep, one round. Are we uh, are we continuing? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, this. I think it's like three weeks from now is the next round. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's in between the Ridge and Laguna Seca. So literally like three weeks in a row, I'll, I'll go to the Ridge and then I'll come, I'll drive back from the Ridge, get home Tuesday, have like Wednesday, Thursday. And then I drive to Utah, race the Utah, drive home, have like Tuesday, Wednesday <laughs> off and then drive to Laguna Seca. You know what I mean? Like literally, I think I, I'm going to work like six days over the next three weeks. Is like how long I'll be gone. You wow. know what I mean? I'll have like two days yeah. in the middle of the week each week to work. Um, but yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be hectic, but yeah, uh, Utah is, this next round is West again, right? Yeah. I believe. Okay. Yes. It um, is. okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we'll hit, we'll hit that again and do West. going to try to see if I can bully Anthony into letting me try out his old ZX-10. Okay. So if that happens, uh, maybe I'll grid up in the KOM next to Anthony and see what, what happens. Oof. Careful. But, <laughs> oof. <laughs> oof. <laughs> um, well, I'm just no, saying uh, ZX-10 versus ZX-10. He might, he yeah, may be no, the, no. Un, the unofficial king of the West right now though. So. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. I think he is. Uh, maybe even well, official. But uh, I, I, I thought you were coming, and I'm glad to hear you. You are coming. You need to come. Uh, hopefully, you can fit it into that busy schedule to come to the fourth round, also. Yeah. Which is it? Yeah, because that's east, right? Yeah, that's east, and Easton is planning on being there as well. Oh, there we go. That'll be cool. Okay. You're gonna race Easton. Uh, I am still trying to work out do the details. It, do it. Help me racing. out. Do it. Do it. Do it. I'm racing the, uh, just the street GP that they offer there. Since they do offer that, it's a pretty unique opportunity. 
tell me yeah, the yeah. license and just kind of enter enter that class but and you haven't we'll done see. that yet right i have not nope oh yeah dude you should do it you'll like it it's good we'll see stuff. yeah well we'll see we'll see what happens Lots of, I gotta, I gotta still plan the entire trip driving from South Carolina to Utah and getting everyone and everything right. out there. So, well, let me help you out. Be done. Let me help you out. I know you got a lot on your plate. You got to plan all that. So let's just say, so you are racing that. That's off your plate now. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? That's easy. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah. Why let it hang out there and bother you when you got all this other stuff to do? Just sign up. Uh, all right. Well, I can't sign up yet because it's still coming soon. So that's the other reason I haven't. I'm not officially doing it because I can't even sign up until this next round is done. So yeah. if you want a real excuse, there you go. That's the that's the there one. <laughs> so and then what kind of bike are you taking out there, Easton? Um, I I mean I don't know. So I have a a track bike, Jixer 750 08. Uh, okay. It's not race prepped, but I don't know what the rules of that class are officially. Because you have to be like track day for tech, but I know they have the other street class where you have to be street legal within 10 minutes. So I don't know what the rules are exactly. I would prefer to take that one, but I also have a fully street legal Aprilia RSV4. So. Mm, yeah, but you don't want to scratch it, huh? Uh, it's, it's scratched. I, first track day. I oh, it's on scratched. It. Yeah. We, we dropped her, a little low speed, off camber, <laughs> left hand turn, and I was on some sort of mm -hmm. uh, sport touring tires, which I had given him like three nice laps of warm up time, and I wasn't pushing it like crazy, and I came into this off camber turn and just laid it down. So yeah. I don't have a problem putting down a bike. Like, that's what they're built for. It, you know, it hurts the pocketbook, but it doesn't like hurt me that much mentally. I don't, I don't yeah. enjoy doing it because. Mostly because when I do a track day, often I'm traveling and I'm trying to get a couple in. And so, you know, if I wreck my bike at the first one, then how much more pain do I have to go through to get to the next one? But as far yeah. as like the emotional, like, oh, no, my bike, my poor bike, like, no, you pick it back up. That's what they're built for. You get it back together and then you go ride it again. So it doesn't bother me too much. That's good. But... Yeah, you, you yeah, have a better head mentality about that than I did, especially when I started. I was... I was scared to scratch my baby, you know, but yeah. it's good. Well, I mean, that's why I put, that. that's why I put race fairings on the Jigsaw before I ended up wrecking it. Cause I was like, you know what? It's a track bike. I need to be okay with just putting this thing down. So that's where we got. And after yeah. that, it was just like everything else that gets wrecked. Like I got new, you know, new clip ons and new rear sets after I wrecked it because they were gone. So <laughs> anyway, but yeah, we'll, we'll be out there. For the August round, the third and fourth, I'm definitely doing the track day on the second down there. I've got to get signed up and do the street GP and see what that's all about. It's also, you know, Cole went straight to racing. It's a pretty unique opportunity there in Utah. We've, we've talked about it here on the podcast quite a bit, but uh, I think it'd be cool to, yeah, take advantage of it, see what it's actually like, and be able to speak a little bit more firsthand of, you know, what it's like to go do that. So, yeah, yeah I'm pretty sure the, the last round in Utah. You need to hit that one too, Wyatt, because that's going to be a family reunion for CBMA. I'm pretty sure. Really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, as of right now, I am planning on hitting all the Utah rounds as long as the funds last. I will be there. Perfect. I'm excited. That's how it goes. Yeah. Well, um, I think that's starting to cover everything. Everything that I had, I was just, you know, the, the whole goal for me of having you on here was why are we on an R6 and not a not a one? Th I'm just kidding. That's not important. Um, I I also kind of want to buy an R6, so I'm a little jealous. Uh, but you're doing great things out there at Moto America. Do you, do you have my my last question? I think, as I understand it, you've got some pretty pretty good numbers, uh, pretty good records in your local local club racing. I know when you go to Moto America, no matter who you are, most of the time it's like, oh wow, okay, this is a, this is a step up, and you're on an R6, which you know we talked about that. That's the main reason why you're maybe a little bit down in the pack. But when you go from just a club race to I, I'm pretty fast, I'm pretty good, to Moto America, as a racer, you know with that hunter mentality, you're constantly, I can be better, I can get faster, I can pass this next guy. And you want to win, and I understand that. But is there like a realistic goal that you set going into the season that isn't just, hey, I want to go win every race? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and I, that's like constantly evolving, right? Like that goal. Um, the whole I, I take the whole like military mindset of like aim small, miss small. Um, mm-hmm. When I try to set those kind of goals, uh, so the uh, same thing like aim high, miss high, kind of is what I'm thinking, right? So if I aim high, even if I think okay, probably not going to be able to get in the top ten, but if I aim for the top ten and I'm disappointed with like a top 15 or a top 20, that's better than aiming for a top 20 and being disappointed with like P30, right? So uh, it, like I said, it's a constantly evolving thing. When I went to my very first round in Pittsburgh uh, last year, like the idea I had in my head was just to be top 20, like to be on the list of names on the TV, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But uh and I think I ended up like 21st or 22nd. So like just outside of that goal, you know, and uh, it was a lot more. It, and even though I had that, that was like the that was the goal I verbalized like to my dad or to anyone who asked. Right. But like in my head, I'm thinking I'm going to get fucking P10. Right now. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, so like, you know, I had to, I had a little bit of a rude awakening like for myself when I got there and me, I'm like, oh, dude, am I even going to qualify for this race? Um so you kind of have to, you do have to be realistic with your expectations, right? And, um, but I still think it's good to go in with a mindset, like, that you're going to do well. Like, you can't show up and think, you can't just be worried about, like, oh, am I even going to make it? You know, because you're kind of just mm-hmm. setting yourself up mentally for failure. Um, but uh, now the goal is always to just do better than I did last round, like, as far as finishing position and, like, the guys that I'm finishing around, right? Like, because, like, I don't know if you've, if you ever look at like mid pack dudes at pro level, like whether it's BSB or Moto America or even like Moto GP, most of the mid pack dudes are always like close to each other. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Because they're all figuring out the same shit, trying to get to the top. Like the top guys, they might win run race and they crash out, you know, like Martin or whatever, or Mark Marquez, like in the top, top level, right? Like those yep. dudes are either winning or crashing, you know? But like the mid pack dudes, they're all like, right here because they're all a lot of what they're doing is trying to gather data like just like i'm saying i'm just trying to do better than i did last round that's the same shit they're doing you know what i mean they're just trying to do better like their team sets an expectation and they're trying to do a little bit better every time you know and so for me it's a lot of times it's finishing the uh, like beating a dude that i did not beat last round Mm -hmm. like if last round in alabama this guy and this guy finished right in front of me well i'm gonna finish right in front of them at the next round you know what i mean and then at the next round whoever finished in front of me at that last round i gotta beat them you know what i mean so um, trying to inch and claw my way forward, you know, and um, I've actually talked a lot about this to Lugnut and we've kind of expressed the same kind of thing. Um, one of the big things I struggle with comparing a club level to the pro level is when I'm going through a turn, like if I'm in second, third, fourth place in a club race and I'm going through a turn and there's a guy right in front of me, you know, I'm on his rear wheel. I very much think to myself, like if his tire is sticking, my tire is going to stick. Like, I can gas it. You know what I mean? Like, I can beat this guy. Like, I am faster right. than this guy in front of me. He is holding me back. You know what I mean? And then at Moto America, um, a lot of times that is not the way it goes, right? Like, we are both dancing out of the corner, and I am not sure if his tire is going to stick. So I am not <laughs> sure if my tire is going to stick. And and I, I do not think, like, I am faster than Kayla Yakov, I am faster than Stefano Mesa. Like, that is not the way I think. You know what I mean? So I'm like, oh, shit, I just got to hang on to freaking Kayla right now or hang on to Stefano, you know? And and so I'm just trying to hang on to them, right? And, like, that's honestly, like, the wrong mentality to have. Like, you do – you need to have the mentality of, like, I'm faster than this person in front of me because then you, your, your mind starts looking for a way around them. It's almost like they talk about professional skiers. I've heard this a lot, this comparison. Sorry to ramble, but oh, you're good. skiers – the fastest way to go like cross country skiing when you're skiing like through the trees is if you're looking for trees you will run into a tree if you look for the path you will only see the path like and so it's the same thing i think when you're following somebody who is or is not faster than you if you believe that they are faster than you you are looking at their rear tire you are trying to comp you're like you're trying to copy their line you're trying to do the things they're doing you're not trying to pass them like you're not seeing their mistakes. You're not seeing when they go a little wide and they left some room on the inside that you could go up on the inside of them or whatever. You know what I mean? You're not seeing those things when you think like, oh, I just got to latch onto this person and get a toe, you know? But when you mm-hmm. have the mentality of like, where can I pass this guy? I need to get around this guy. I have two laps. I need to get around this guy. You know what I mean? Which is like an example at USBA when I went last time 
um, like the local, at least what I was told, the local fast guy, you know what I mean? Like, and I was catching up to him and I thought to myself, like I could see him coming closer and closer to me every lap, you know, and I thought to myself, I'm faster than this guy. And, um, it, I, I need to be able to carry that mentality over to Moto America. So I'd say that's, that's one of the big differences is trying to come into it with that headset head mindset. Right. Yeah. Well, and that makes sense. I like that answer a lot. That's, uh, I'd say I, I can't blame you too much for not having the mentality shift too. showing up to, you know, it's, it, we, we talked a, a few weeks ago when we were down in Alabama together with the, with the whole privateer industries team, just, just getting that many guys together and trailering the bikes across the country, getting everyone there and getting set up is like a feat among, you know, of itself. And so yeah. I got to give you props for even being able to have headspace left for racing <laughs> after qualifying yeah. and doing the practice and learning a new track and like do i have food tonight and then you know whatever yeah. else there might be so it's a lot to a lot to digest and a lot to do and uh i think you're doing great and say we wish you the best of best of luck and drink water go faster and hope this season turns out good we'll do thanks man it's gonna be good i look forward to seeing you at the ridge yep and yes sir you too all right. Well, anyway, um, if you're watching, listening, you know, join us on YouTube, wherever else. Thank you. We appreciate you guys being here. Go check out Moto America, the Ridge next year. If you're up in the PNW, I know, or not next week, next year, sorry, next week. If you're up in the PNW, we got quite a few listeners up there. What, Cole? Why? We never gave you the opportunity to. Oh yeah. Sh- anybody you want to shout out? Anybody you want to? Uh- I mean, I'll shout out the whole privateer team, you know, Anthony and uh, Will, Mike, Nick, Johnny, my dad, Jerry Ferguson, my wife for always being back here, holding the fort down while I'm gone so much during the race season. Vortex Racing helped me out a lot this year and uh, Dunlop Tires, you know, they're uh, they're doing good. So that's about it. But thank you to everyone who comes around. I, I had a couple guys walk up to me at the Brainerd round and, and talk to me and say that they watched some of my YouTube videos um, over on Berg Factory Racing. And that's really cool, man. Uh, like kind of humbling to have like fans, you know, uh, I, I don't like to say I'm not worthy of having fans, but having friends that will come up to me and say right. that they watch my stuff. That's awesome. So just all everyone who's involved, man. Thanks to everybody, you know. Yeah. Yeah, go go check out his YouTube channel. Go check out his Instagram also, Ferg Factory Racing, I think for both, right? Yep. And go watch Moto America. And guess what? If you show up in person, you don't even have to worry about the TV. You can just watch it. So Yeah. We'll we'll leave everyone with that. Thanks again for watching and listening. And we'll see you all next week. Okay. Thank you. See you next week. <laughs>